Uh, welcome to the John Adams. Welcome again back for many of you. I see many familiar faces and that always makes me very happy to see how incredibly loyal and dedicated so many of our John Adams followers are. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams, and this month I'm celebrating my five years as director. It's my sister. <laughs> as the director and I've always found it an important and uh, delightful place to be affiliated with because I think what we do is interesting but especially since the new developments in the White House and in American politics I think what the John Adams does is more important than ever before. We bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands and I think now as um, you see the country descending on the eve of the elections on Tuesday into increasingly antagonistic partisanship. It's so much more difficult to have uh, uh, a civilized dialogue that I am so glad that the John Adams exists, at least in Amsterdam, and only in Amsterdam, to bring people together to bring you intelligent, reflective, thoughtful, talented, best and brightest American voices to show that there really still is, that those people still really do exist. In the <laughs> We're neutral, by the way. <laughs> and one of those best and brightest is here with us today, and that's the author Richard Powers, who is here to talk about his newest book, The Overstory, which has appeared in translation with Avos Contax. And we're also very grateful to Avos Contax, uh, who is also a friend of the John Adams, for the happy collaboration in bringing a wonderful person like Powers to the John Adams. Our moderator today is uh, Joost Vries, whom you know as an editor of the magazine The Groen Amsterdammer. He is also a novelist in his own right, and he told me just now that his second novel, The Republic, is appearing in April in the US in English translation with a publisher called The Other Press. It has already actually appeared in 10 other languages, including Korea. So uh, congratulations to you guys on the, the new publication of your new novel. Uh, our program today, Joost will give an introduction. That will be on our site tomorrow so that you can reread it at your leisure and also peruse the upcoming events at the John Adams. I'll come back at the end of our afternoon today to say something about our upcoming events. Um, Joost will then have a conversation with uh, Mr. Powers and also with you. I know there are a lot of fans here. So please don't hesitate to ask him what you've always wanted to ask him, because this is your opportunity. Uh, <laughs> and then I'll come back afterwards, as I mentioned, to say something about our upcoming events. And then we'll go all we'll have a drink and buy the book, which is for sale, thanks to Austin Book Hall here in the, uh, in the hall. And uh, Powers will be signing, but in a special way, which he'll say something about later as well. So now the floor is for our wonderful moderator. I'm so glad to be back with us, Joost Fries. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Our next guest, our upcoming speaker, is an American writer. He was born in Evanston, Illinois. He is a National Book Award winner, winner a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant. He is the historic creative writing. He has been twice nominated for Man Book Prize. And Willie has lived for a couple of years in Gerda, in Edinburgh. <laughs> now, I find it difficult to imagine being Dutch and living in Gerda. I find it even harder to imagine an American writer of the epic kind of novels that our guest is writing living there. But then again, I should say, why not? This is a writer whose novels are simply all over the place, set in different countries, in different continents, in different ages, in different wars, in different political situations. And his characters tend to be the playthings of the time, the, the times they live in. He debuted with a novel called Three Farmers on the Way to a Dance in 1985. This was a novel inspired by an old picture, I'm sure you can tell us where he found it, taken perhaps in 1913 or 1914, of three young men, probably German, on the way to a fest. The happiness of the picture is, of course, darkened by our knowledge that the First World War was about to begin 
probably dragging his young hands, still in early career. The novel is written from several perspectives. Uh, this is the kind of novel I should point out, I really, really like. This is the kind of novel that kind of tells a story and also tells how the story is being made at the same time. Uh, and one of the perspective is that probably of the novelist imagining what happens to the boys, what their fate will be, how they will experience the war. And the other perspective is more contemporary. It's more reflecting in a very essayistic way on the rise of technology and mankind's millions of new ways to give itself. Um, and I suppose you can say that, you can ask him that in a minute as well, this has formed kind of a, a way of thinking about literature for the writer. Um, he's constantly making up narratives and stories about ordinary people sweeped up by politics and history, but also sweeped up by science and new technology. His, his books, I suppose, must be very annoying to hear your books are cerebral. No, and of course, they have. <laughs> of course, they're not cerebral, they're about human beings and they're about, uh, they're about love and about life and about dying and all those things that make us mortal and make us human. But there also, there's always a, a concept, something that kind of lifts them up from just the human story. Um, and when I say the books are about ordinary people, I should point out that they are ordinary people with quite often extraordinary minds. Um, I was thinking of the main character of his novel, 2014, I believe, Orfeo, uh, which is an, uh, the main character is an, an elderly avant-garde composer, uh, contemporary of John Cage, uh, who does his own experience, like his hobby, in biohacking probably more precise, uh, he biohacks musical patterns in bacterial human pathogen. No. No, we all need a hobby, right? <laughs> uh, and of course, unfortunately, in, in typical fashion, uh, by sheer chance, there has to be a, a couple of police officer, officers enter his home and see the biohacking, and of course, this being shortly after the 9-11 situation with the National Security Agency, so they accuse him and suspect him of being a bioterrorist. Um, some more extraordinary minds. Let's look at his novel Galatea 2.2, which is about a novelist turned teacher by a writer's block, so he starts to teach. Once upon a time, the writer lived in the Netherlands, in Denmark, oh, well, kind of Winston, <laughs> probably, um, gets involved into teaching an artificial intelligent um, program about life and love and literature, the three L's. And the mind of the artificial intelligence becomes so smart that she decides to leave the human world. Um, or more extraordinary minds in his books. Um, has anyone by any chance read the 2006 National Book Award from The Echo Maker? Which is about a man who has a car accident, wakes up from his coma, and is pretty sure his sister is an imposter. I mean, she, she sounds like her and she looks like her, but he's sure she somehow isn't. And much of that book deals with a new, uh, neurologists trying to explain what exactly goes on in his mind. And now the newest book. The book we are going to talk about is the old story. And it's also filled with, you can call them ordinary people, but they perform extraordinary feats. The old story comes with a great, great blurb on the dust jacket. It's like the million dollar blurb by Margaret Atwood. And Atwood writes about her guest that if he was to be, quote, an American writer living in the 19th century, which writer would he be? He'd probably be Herman Melville of Moby Dick. His picture is that big. So I was thinking, if the overstory was a picture, what would the picture be like? Well, clearly, I would say the picture would be huge. It would be bigger than a garage door or something. It, it would be the kind of picture that fills up an entire wall in a museum, green and big and blue with a blue sky to overhead. Um, it would be something like the pictures of all the beer stuff, if you know them. Um, or perhaps even more like the pictures painted by one of the Dutch 17th century uh, painters who, who made all kinds of landscapes. And 
you would see probably an enormous vista of the American West, the nature, the plains, the mountains, the trees. And only if you look at it for a little while, take a few steps back, you'll notice there are also human beings in the pictures. Um, somewhere down below, living beneath the trees. And you can say that nature is the overstories, the human beings are the understory. The overstory is a novel that tells several tales that in the course of the book will slowly come together. There is, for example, the story of Douglas Pavlicek, a veteran, who, Vietnam veteran, who falls from the sky during the war in Vietnam and is saved by falling into an enormous tree. Um, there is a story of Nila Meta, a wonderfully smart whiskey, clearly brilliant, who falls from a tree and loses his ability to walk. There is the story of Nicholas Wu, a struggling artist, whose family used to grow big chestnut trees on their farm. There is a story of Mimi Ma, daughter of a Chinese immigrant who loves the Melbourne bush before planted before committing suicide. There is a story of the bullied Adam Epic, who, only sees, who sees only logical behavior in the world of ants, not so much in humans. There is that of Ray and Dorothy, a nice sweet couple of lawyers slash amateur actors, who find themselves more and more involved in nature and plants. Their love affair blossoms because they uh, see the Dunsador Forest in Macbeth come to life. Uh, there's a story of Olivia von der Griff, who lives life recklessly, almost dies, and then sets out to find something worth living for. There's a story of Patricia Westerfall, for, for, who falls from grace in the academic world after publishing an article in which she states that trees have a way of communicating with each other and warning each other for threats, such as bugs and fungus. <coughs> the academic world scorns her. She finds herself unemployed, severely depressed. But she hasn't lost the love for nature. And she writes, years from now, she'll write a book of her own, The Secret Forest. Its opening page will read, you and the tree in your backyard come from a common ancestor. A billion and a half years ago, the two of you parted ways, but even now, after an immense journey in separate directions, that tree and you still share a quarter of your genes. She stands in a clearing at the top of the rise, she's in a forest, this is house. Looking out over her shallow gully, aspens everywhere. And it boggles her mind that not one of them has grown from seed. All through this part of the West, few aspens have done so in 10,000 years. Long ago, the climate changed, and aspen seed can no longer thrive there. But they propagate by root, they spread. There are aspen colonies up north where the ice sheets were, older than the sheets themselves. The motionless, motionless trees are migrating, immortal strands of aspen retreating before the latest two mile thick glaciers, then following them back north again. Life will not answer to reason. And meaning is too young a thing to have much power over it. All the drama of the world is gathering underground. Mass symphonic choruses that Patricia means to hear before she dies. So, all the drama in the world. The other story is clearly a book about trees. It's obviously a book about nature. It's, the, it's about the way humans interact with nature. But it's also a novel about people searching for meaning, searching for something to connect with. The overstory is very much a novel about purpose. Um, I was going to say what a, what a ridiculously brilliant book it is. Uh, it's, it's conceptual as well, warm and human, but um, the author is here and it would be kind of and embarrassing. <laughs> it would go on for very long. Um, and it would completely undermine my role as interviewer to ask <laughs> the hard hitting questions. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the Oscar Pedro Mr. Richard Powell. <laughs>
you don't mind indulging me, a little self-indulgent nostalgia, only the front rows will be able to see this. American Literature Today, 29 January 1992. The Creative Misunderstanding, Richard Powers, Moderator Boss Hainer, in the West Indies. West Indies Heist, Adam Zayden and So, and there's the photo that, uh, uh, that Yost was talking about, the famous opera photo of the three farmers. I look at that and I think, that is an age of Helena. <laughs> or, as philosophers wiser than myself once put it, what a long, strange trip it's been. Uh, I don't have anything prepared. I have a short section from the book that I thought I might read later in the course of the conversation. But what I was hoping to do by way of introducing our conversation together was to start with setting a little philosophical conundrum as a background, something that I had begun to notice after 11 books and a third of a century writing that was bothering me prior to the more uh, immediate stimulus that launched the book. So set the stage with that, and then I'll tell you the brief story of the moment of origin where I set off into this forest uh, without any path or trail to, to lead me in, with no experience whatsoever, and managed come out back uh, out on the other end a very different person. Um, there is a formula beloved by teachers of literature in the United States, at least it was beloved back in the day when I was studying. I came across it several times uh, throughout grade school and even into high school. And this was a formula about the, the levels of drama that can propel a novel or any piece of fiction. Where can conflict come from? And it was a relatively simple schema, but even now, on reflection, having devoted my life to trying to find other sources of drama, it's hard to argue with this simple three-step uh, blueprint. There are dramas that are based on conflicts of value within an individual person's mind. We all know this. No matter what we have as our primary value, the one that we would, you know, we would hold on to when we were backed into the darkest corner, having that value, holding that value, immediately creates conflicts with equal but secondary and incommensurable. So for instance, I might highly prize, above all things, honesty, but also feel as if loyalty is an essential part of my interaction with any other person. If my friend then came to me and presented with behavior that I could not tolerate, I would have to choose between honesty and loyalty. That's enough. And we call that a psychological novel. My fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Follett, who was somewhat from the sexist language, as we all were back in the day, would call it the novel of man against himself. The next level, of course, would be that I hold a primary value that's absolutely incommensurable with your primary value. I favor freedom. You favor equality and fairness. We have the political novel that is called the United States of America, <laughs> or any other country for that matter. Um, that's called the sociological or the political novel, man against man. Uh, to, to, to bring this up today and to avoid any uh, Twitter posts or Facebook uh, scandals, I, I will change now to human against human. Uh, there, there is a third level of dramatic conflict, which is man against God, human against God, or the environment, or the 
the world for the non-humans. That somehow our values that we hold as a species, that are inherent in our vision of ourselves and destiny of people on this world, will come into contact, a conflict with, irreconcilable conflict with, a world and or its maker that simply has other plans for us. And these, when you think, these are the great novels of the 19th century. When, when I think about American literature, something like Moby Dick, you know, to, to, to go back to the, to the author reference, is precisely about this third level of dramatic conflict. Yes, we do see interior conflicts in the individual characters, and we do see conflicts between the characters in the novel, but the grand metaphysical conflict in the book is between someone who, a group of human beings whose values are incommensurable with a world that simply has different plans for them. Humans against nature. It, I guess it had been a growing preoccupation with me throughout the course of my career as I struggled to try to find novels that would somehow blow out the traditional constraints of storytelling to extend the story beyond the personal and beyond the local into larger uh, transhuman themes, that somehow this third level of drama had dropped out of literary fiction to some degree. That literary fiction now was somehow working under the assumption that that great conflict was over we had somehow won. We had either domesticated the natural world and could now we have things more or less on our own terms. We were well on our way toward the completely dominating the constraints of time to some uh, space and to some extent time. And that anything, any further journey into that exploration would be somehow quaint. It would, it would read like a, like a Jack London novel. Uh, antiquated, interesting, but somehow beside the point. The point was how difficult it is for us to master ourselves and, and come to terms with, the own, uh, with our own internal turmoil and the turmoil that we create instantly by, by beginning to talk to another person. I would say that this is, this is a broad, broad generalization, but it does seem somewhat true for Western belletristic fiction. Right? There are whole genres like fantasy and science fiction that continue to take these issues extremely seriously. And then, there are, of course, there, there are great strains of non-Western literature that never stop taking these things seriously. I'm just talking about the, the, the legacy that I had as someone who wanted to contribute to Western high literature, let's call it. Um, now, of course, we're in the age where all those kinds of distinctions are breaking down quite wonderfully, quite productively. But I'm going to tell a story now that reveals my bias and reveals the way that I tried to follow my way outside of this uh, prohibition, uh, the event that kind of triggered my realization. That, that giving up on that third level of drama was also in itself a kind of a priori commitment to a tacit belief that meaning was primarily an independent of an individual humanist, human, human-centric, commodity-based, subjective and synthetic construct. There is no meaning out there. We simply have to make it all for ourselves. And that we've been so deeply colonized by that notion that it, you know, as you hear that formulation, some of you might be saying, of course, what other possibility is there? Well, my moment for discovering what the other possibility might be happened when I was a professor at Stanford University in California. And this is about six years ago. 
for those who don't know, Stanford is a city uh, in Northern California, just a little bit to the south of San Francisco, in the heart of Silicon Valley. Which means that this powerhouse technical university, great center for physics, all physical sciences, for engineering, and especially for computer science, was situated within easy walking distance from the headquarters of Google, Apple, Intel, HP, Facebook, Netflix, you name it. There is all of the companies that have been producing this revolution, creating the present which we now live, and rapidly designing the future that we're hurtling toward, were all compressed in this little space between San Francisco and San Jose. It's a hell of a place to live. And it, it, it creates an astonishing go-go culture, a culture that's going to transcend all things. I mean, if you went to a dinner party in Silicon Valley, it wouldn't be at all out of the ordinary to have this kind of transhumanist conversation come up at dinner. We're all going to live forever. We can just hang on a little bit longer. You've seen the, the unlimited potential of human intellect, and we're now s somehow on the verge of some medical breakthrough that's going to stop that, or arrest it, or roll it back, or barring that, some kind of explosion, the singularity, as it's called, uh, by this culture, where we're going to upload our soul into the cloud, and somehow you know, so we're, we're, we're going to, what, whatever crisis, whatever anxiety the private self has, is addressable somehow, or will be addressable in the techno sublime future. When that future got a little bit much for me, luckily I was able to head back into the past, that is, up into the Santa Cruz Mountains above Silicon Valley, and into the second growth redwood forest, the Carlsbad Mountain Range. And I can't pretend that I was particularly finely attuned to the non-human at that, at, at that time in my life. I didn't know a, 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 an ash tree from an elm tree. A redwood's a hard tree not to be able to identify. And you don't need a particularly sensitive soul to be knocked out by one. And when you are in a forest where you, you're walking for miles and miles among these juridical giants, presences. It's hard not to feel like you're in some kind of you know, the, the largest cathedral ever made. You know, it's, it's a sacred space. One day, as I was walking through this forest, I came across a survivor. You see, these forests had all been cut down to build San Francisco. Not once, but twice after the, after the fire and the earthquake. Somehow this tree got away. And maybe, maybe it was flawed in a way that the loggers realized. Uh, maybe they just you know, got sentimental and thought they'd leave one last hostage sitting up there on the bridge. This tree was as wide as this room. Okay? And it went up 100 meters or more. And it, 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 you know, a, a football pitch. I, I could, standing underneath it, I couldn't see the top of the tree. And I may have that it was at least 1,300 years old and probably closer to 2,000 years old, so as old as Jesus. And I'm standing in the presence of this thing, thinking, you wanted to tell a story? You wanted to tell a personal, private story? There's something else going on up here. And then there was immediately another insight, which is this entire mountain range was peppered with trees this size until we got to them. Immediately that tree could get another insight, which is Silicon Valley is down there because these trees were up here. We had an unbelievable resource to run through in order to fulfill our destiny. And I thought, why had I never read that story? You know, where, where was the fiction that told that 
story between the fates of trees and the fates of people. When I came back down and started reading, I, I, I saw that that story was handled again and again in nonfiction ways. That, that many, many people have declared our civilization to be completely contingent on the availability of these environments. And it was it stunned me to learn that 97% of the native forests on the North American continent when Europeans came have been cut down to make America. Of course, to a native longer, you're saying, well, at least you have 3% remaining. So you have zero. <laughs> uh, but to then discover on subsequent hikes in the area, trees almost the size of my Methuselah tree with blue axes on them, slated to cut still in the 2000s. As I did my research, I, I continued to, to circle back on this moment in the late 90s, early 2000s, where large numbers of otherwise apolitical ordinary people decided 97% is enough and decided to put their own bodies and safety on the line and say no more. And that's the story that I ended up telling the old story, or the central story, among the other roots and branches that, that Yo so, so nicely summarized. So the suggestion is simply this, and then we'll launch the conversation, that perhaps literary fictions retreat into the psychological and the social. I shouldn't say retreat, because endlessly magnificent novels can be made out of all out of those dramas and, and continue to be every year. But something's missing from the picture. And it has to do with, as I mentioned earlier, this prior commitment to this thing that has colonized us all, which is the belief that somehow we're the only interesting act in town. That we're the only thing with agency, the only thing with the destiny. For most of world literature, in most cultures, over the, over the majority of, of human history, the story has been otherwise. The non-humans were at the center. We could not understand ourselves without understanding all these other creatures that made us possible. And I'm going to leave it there and join you also when I have a conversation. <laughs> So what we're going to do is Rich and I are going to talk and I'm going to open up the floor a couple of times for people with questions. So feel free to I'm not going to say ask anything, but uh, as long as it's related to Rich's powers. <laughs> That's where we go. So we'll, we'll, we'll go back and forth. Um, Richard, one of the characters in the old story, Adam, is I would say on the spectrum, probably. You would say nowadays. Well, that's what we call the spectrum. The spectrum, yeah, of course. Um, and he's very bullied in, in school, mostly because he finds, well, he finds a passion in ants. He finds a more, um, he, he just looks at them, how they work, how methodical they are. And he's one of the characters who comes up with the idea which probably perhaps helps you along around this book or, or triggers you to. He more or less says, why are people only interested in stories by people? Right. Why are they not able to form a narrative in which they are not the main principle? Um, was, was that one of the things that, that got you cooking? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the great pleasures of writing this book is trying to handle this very large cast of characters, nine people. The way that I did that was by indulging my own multiple personality disorder, <laughs> creating in each of these nine people some aspect of myself. And for, for me, it wasn't ants, it was bees. I, I, I grew up in suburban Chicago, and I was the bee boy. Uh, 
And it was, it was shortly after those astonishing discoveries about uh, bee communication and how they would advance their advance and they would indicate to the rest of the hive uh, how far away the flowers, the nectar sources were by these elaborate uh, codified gestures. I just couldn't get enough of that. And I couldn't get enough of, of, of this idea that somehow there were forms of intelligence that were so bizarre to us that we couldn't even recognize them as intelligence and group intelligences. Of course, once again, the sci-fi people are all over this, right? And uh, uh, the Borg and assimilation you know, comes from our anxiety at seeing uh, high intelligence here on this earth. Um, I wanted Adam, uh, I switched him to ants for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, as kind of homage to E.O. Wilson, um, who coined this idea of hyophilia. Uh, Wilson's main academic uh, animal of study is the ant. Uh, and then it was also, I had this image of this boy borrowing his sister's nail polish and putting dots of different colored nail polish on the ants, and depending on where the man sees them as they're moving across this great landscape, and then watching the colors uh, arrange themselves in different patterns. I just thought it was a very visual way of bringing this collective intelligence to, to, to light. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> That you always try to see whenever you're reading a book, you're trying to see the, the start of the day. You know, so yeah, yeah, you're trying yeah. to figure out where, where did this book start. Right. And of course, you mentioned in your introduction, it was like a more of an abstract philosophical idea of, of novels changing uh, the, the three forms of drama. An, an abstract I, I, idea that was priming the, you know, uh, in, the, in the distal way, the more proximal material stimulus of this very real world thing. So it's a combination of this long-standing back burner preoccupation uh, with this abstract notion, running into something in the physical world that now needs to be addressed in a much more media way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious because you know many of the novels take different forms, and of course this this takes the form of um, several individual storylines eventually coming together. Right. So that was why I was saying, well, I'm sure we must have started with, with one of them. Um, but well, but when did you... Novelist, you read three novels. You know, if, whenever you ask a novelist, where did it start from and how did you get to the finish, they're going to lie to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to get the nice story out of how the story came to be. But I can't say this about the structure. So those of you who have looked at the book, you see, you know, the first section is called Roots. And it starts out in a very strange way for a novel. There are, there are eight sequential chapters that function almost like short stories, where each of these characters are, are developed throughout their backstory. And, and by page 100, you start to get anxious. And you, you, you say, I paid for a novel. And it was a <laughs> uh, but then there's this sort of belated moment that the suggestion here. It's like a, it's like a, a camera panning back. The suggestion that wait, they're, they're going to come together, and indeed they do in that second section called Trunk. And as their group effort reaches its catastrophic uh, climax, uh, they're blown apart and uh, separated and head into life underground uh, along different paths. And of course, that's the crown of the branches. And the final section of the book is called Seeds, in which long-range, unforeseen consequences of their action come back down to Earth and, and start again in some other way. I would like to say, oh yes, you know, I had this vision, you know, yeah. uh, from the beginning. Yeah. And, and there it was. I was writing this tiny sequoia uh, structure of a little book. And, you know, I mean, we just get lucky, you know. Uh, I, I, I stumbled toward it, you know. I thought, well, the best way to handle such a large cast is to do it chronologically because people, if we naturally align things, you know, the on the timeline, and people will be able to keep track of all these folks. And, you know, I did that version where everything was just told chronologically when one character, you know, is, you know, preempted by some action from another in the same year, so we cut back to that character. When I read that draft, I couldn't keep the characters straight. 
So it, it was only retroactively that I went back and, 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 and did that. that. Yeah. And once I, once I did that reverse engineering and put all the backstories together and separately, it was just this kind of, you know, after the fact, act of saying, oh, there it is. You know, uh, there, there's my structure. Yeah, because uh, I read a, a, just a very short passage from Patricius. Yeah, and, 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 yeah but, but that's, uh, of course, people come here to, to listen to you speak, so I, I, I want to read, uh, the, uh, the, I want to read a, a larger uh, piece from Patricia, where she is kind of the first moment, the first instance in the book where the, metaf the metaphor is being made of, yeah. of the trees branching out and communicating with each other. And that's probably not by coincidence, also the kind of like uh, the same fragment of the book where she has, or not she, but the, the, the narrator right. takes like this all of a sudden goes up high and looks down at yeah. these different characters at their different places in the book right. being connected, but not knowing they are connected yet. Yeah, well it was interesting because in, in the passage that you read about these enormous global Aspen colonies, the interesting thing about the, the aspects that, that you're reading about is above ground, they might, you know, they're, they're, they're rarely more, much more than 100 years old. Right? They're, they're, they're in that 70, 80 years then. But underground, the roots, the, 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 the root system that are propagating these clonal stems, 100,000 years old. And in fact, there are people who put that out in order of magnitude and say it might be close to a million years so. old. If you read last week's news, New York Times, you'll see that these, the, the, the largest living thing on Earth, and by some measures, perhaps one of the oldest continuous living things on Earth, is now dying. And it's that urgency, that sense that this, this tremendous legacy is vanishing in one way or another that propels a lot of the book too. But I mention it because it's the moment that Patricia is thinking about the relative youth and apparent distinctiveness of these different Aspen trunks, and yet their absolute genetic identity underground and their incredible long-lived legacy and continuity underground. That's the moment when the narrator first steps back and says, Remember those other yeah, eight people that you've been introduced to? Yeah. Here's what this one is doing right now, and here's what the other is doing right now. So it's, it's precisely her first communion with the absolute interdependence of these colonies that the reader shares in saying, oh, we're not talking about separate characters in this story. We're actually talking about a, a combined organism. Yeah. 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 Now, I was curious. When I started, we will talk more about the, 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 the I do believe there's sort of a, a political message in your book, perhaps, so we can talk about it later on, <laughs> obviously. Um, but I was curious, like, I was, when I started reading the book, um, rather early on, perhaps even when I bought it in the store, I thought, oh, is this book going to be about people being chained to trees? And you mentioned that uh, that was something that was going on in the 90s in San Francisco. And it almost, that, that image, uh, you know, to go uh, uh, tree huggers, it's almost like um, a cliche nowadays for people being naive environmentalists. It's almost like, um, um, wh why do you think is that? Is it just because yeah. it, it feels so hopeless, the one person in the tree with, yeah. a, with the army of bulldozers? Yeah, how that particular term became a pejorative one? Became yeah, of course it's a pejorative term. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and we, we might as well get into that political question because that, that story, that confrontation, does provide the central dramatic tension of the book. There was a moment in my, in my journey, I almost said my metamorphosis. There's a lot of metamorphosis. All his fingerprints are all over this. Yeah, uh, was, yeah he's a, he got me straight to it. As are many other myths and legends from from different world literatures. That was, you, you mentioned a kind of uh, uh, multicultural cast. That was, you know, one of my pleasures was also, you know, setting up an ensemble that allowed me to journey into different cultural relationships with trees too, and to explore how central they are to each of these stories. 
But um, what I wanted to say is there was a moment as I was doing this uh, research, which ultimately ended up being about 120 book length studies of trees. That is not, not to mention the magazine articles and just following journals or online stuff, but you know, individual printed volumes. Where I thought, you know, I want to write this with the trees as the central antagonist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there are some technical challenges involved in that. Uh, making compelling to human readers things that don't seem to move at all. Right? That uh, uh, some of whom live 7,000 years and the, the bristle on pine and the ponds in the white mountains in California that are older than human writing. How do we even wrap our heads around that? So of course the compromise is, you know, you use the traditional elements of novel, the traditional hooks of you know, what, what is it that interests, really interests us? Well, gossip and property. Right? <laughs> <laughs> who's up and who's down? Or who's in and who's out? Who's going who's to end up marrying whom? And who's going to end up getting the, the divorce, you know, petrol money at the end? So how can I, it's, it's almost paradoxical. How can I write this book that in some ways has this grand, maybe anti-humanist isn't quite the right formulation, because that word humanist has so many balances. Yeah, anti-humanist sounds like, so I like think nature, if you're a humanist, you, you would be in favor of nature. Keeping right. nature around as much as possible. Exactly, yeah. right. Just um, yeah. But maybe, what, what would be a better word than, let's say, anthropocentrism? Yeah. A, a grand book that says, our story is bigger than we think it is. And we have to get over ourselves a little bit in order to come back home, in order to have this uh, return to thinking of ourselves. Uh, maybe a better way to say this, in order to give to these other creatures the sanctity that we ordinarily reserve only for ourselves. But you have to use this essential humanist art form to do it. You have to use the novel in order to bring people to this new relationship to non people. Yeah. That, that's the problem, you know, and, and, and you were mentioning you know, the, this confrontation, this tree hugger, or uh, you know, well, why, why is it that to, to tell this environmental story, I have to return to this notion of people who you know, are combating the, the forces that want to take these trees down. And I just think, it's like any myth, you know, you, you simply have to say, we can't get over this aspect of our own story. We have to go back and we have to revisit it. And we have to make it palpable and real. We have to make it visceral. You, know, the, 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 you as an ordinary reader need to feel, oh my God, is this, you know, they are spraying pepper spray into this woman's eye. And, and you have to have that in order to say, you know, to, to be led into this other drama. This drama that's so much harder to see that unfold on a time frame that we can barely even try around. Yeah. Because I don't know if you've read about it, just that the Indian author, I mean, of course, sure. he published a, 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 a book like essay, yes. I think two years perhaps ago, uh, The Great Derangement, where he more or less tries to figure out why climate change is so missing from fiction. Right. And why it's so difficult to write about it. It's going to sound it's, uh, uh, unfortunately fulsome, but I was so gratified when he started tweeting about this book. He said, This is, this is what I'd like to see. Yeah, yeah this, that's the first thing he wrote, but finally, uh, uh, more or less, uh, a book to answer his question. And he comes to the fact that we're so used to thinking about stories as you know, starting out and having a hero. Right. Whereas with climate change, there's no hero available. And, right? and no <laughs> visible drama. Yeah, and no visible right. uh, villain except right. all of us. Right. Yeah. And, and it, you know, when we see when we see art somehow approaching this intractable problem that, that you just mentioned, it often has to become metaphorical, like uh, Lars von Trier's Melancholy. This thing is coming. It's coming. 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 Right. Yeah. And they're still having the way. You know? It's like the comet to Earth. Yeah. So it's not it's explicitly a, a, a climate film, but we can see very clearly that it's an attempt to, yeah. to, to find the form. The end times on the Earth. Yes, yeah. Yeah. that's right. Um, to talk about how difficult it is for human beings to take seriously 
stories that do unfold on scales that are so different than our three score and ten. Yeah. You know? And, and this other thing that you alluded to in your introduction, it also comes in in the Patricia story, where Patricia's, you know, she comes to her father. She, she uh, suffers from a hearing impediment as a child, which means that her speech is also extremely difficult to understand, which alienates her from all the children that she's growing up with. But of course, her, well, her father is an agricultural extension agent and says there are other worlds that you can, you can enter into. And she becomes plant patty. She becomes the girl who lives for green things. And she's asking her father, I do not understand. You know, I'm going, these girls are just idiots. They look at this thing and everything is a maple. You know, everything is a maple. And, and he says, Well, that's Adam's curse. We don't really, really pay attention to things that look like us. It's interesting, I just completed an anthology of essays, Dutch essays, mm -hmm. from the starting in 2000 till now, if you share out. The essays of the Netherlands has changed, and so I spent many days in, in the Royal Library going through everything, every book of essays, uh -huh. and there were like a hundred essays on porn, and like one, perhaps one, on climate change, wow. on the environment. Wow. So it is... Well, we're going to get a porn problem. Yeah, we're <laughs> Um, but but um, did you feel compelled to write a book, a bit to, to write this book as a as more or less perhaps you should call an antidote to that kind of lack, that kind of that missing element from fiction? It's but just of course was, was writing and speaking uh, about. It's just a kind of homecoming. It's just a kind of remembering that a this used to be central to the stories that we told about ourselves. Yeah. And B, it's going to have to become central again if we want to stick around. What's interesting is the rehabilitation of science fiction and fantasy has almost, you know, it's, it's come as a belated realization that we didn't win that third war. In fact, we're likely to be the grand losers unless we get it together very quickly and very conservatively. Now, I think, now that it's on everyone's mind, I think we'll see a great resurgence of this kind of book in literary fiction. Yeah. Well, you can see it, I don't know what you meant, but the, for example, the, the, the dystopian novel right. is through the roof. Yeah. It, it used to be like solely for, for, um, for science fiction or something, right. but now it, it, it's Right in the middle of the yeah, street. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, it, it is it is strange that it should gain some popularity, that it should be a therapeutic thing for people who yeah. have to read the story in the headlines every day. That you know, that escapist fiction might be somehow providing you use the word antidote. I think that's maybe exactly yeah. what's happening. But isn't escapist fiction? Isn't it just to look at the hard and it's still, I think, I think about this as right. es escapism, no. as a, no. uh, in heightened form of reality. That, that's what I mean when I say it's, right. it's, the, it's the antibody to, yeah. I mean, it's priming us to think and respond productively to this, to this other narrative that's in the world. Yeah, perhaps uh, time yeah. for a question from the audience. There was one out there already. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I actually have three questions, though. I <laughs> Please stand up. Okay. I have three questions, but I'll make it short. Um, first, you said there is a relationship between the Red and Ford being there and the Silicon Valley emerging there. Yeah. Do you mean by that that those trees are so so old, thousands and thousands of years, that they're like a database of information that has been left in the area that it emerged there? Secondly, do you feel that that whole tree talked to you? in a sense, inspired you to write the book that you're writing. And thirdly, uh, to what extent does your book also address issues of Native Americans who already have a culture of Mother Earth's a living being? Right. And basically, we as the West think that we are now discovering that, but it's, it's already been there in right. ancient cultures. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, let me, let me start, well, sh should I start with? Well, let me start with the first. In the, the simplest relationship 
than I intended by saying so Havel is down there because these trees were up here. It's the most banal that we simply, as in so many aspects of our civilization building, we're, we're spending principle. That, that we, 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 how would you say that? that, that we're not living off the interest of the earth. We're actually going toward, we're using the resources. Yeah, okay, yeah, in that right? That, that in, in the most literal sense, um, we used that wood, and not just to build buildings, right? There, there's a moment in the book, you remember this with Douglas and Barrow, where they start listing off these things that derive from wood that the oh, yeah. that human economies depend on. And it, it'll blow your mind. So it, most of us simply as a resource. Okay. We had to spend that patrimony, that legacy, in order to, to build what we built. Right? The second, there are, there are other senses too. And that's this, this the techno sublime <coughs> dream that, I'm, that I was describing at the dinner parties in Silicon Valley. It's just the 2014 version of Manifest Destiny. Right? It's still the same sense of the unlimited opportunity that the land has given us. It's trees as metaphor that launch this fantasy of absolute dominance and control. So, so there are some, there, there are many different ways in which um, those forests uh, made possible civilization. For, for a good examination of another relationship uh, between uh, what we've been able to build and what we've actually stolen from the arborescent world would be a William Logan's book, Oak, The Cradle of Civilization. And the subtitle gives it all away. I mean, he, he talks about the way in which our, the, the, the culture, specifically the Anglo-American culture, relied so intensely at every turn upon the use of this tree, which, you know, when I first started to think about this, I thought, wow, are you serious? You're going to make a whole, a whole historical claim about the contingency of, of what we've done based on this resource? Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. You have to take literally the idea that without these things, we wouldn't have been able to build the the tool-based leverage, the, all of these propagating you know, economic uh, uh, systems that allow us to get where we've gone. Um, so to the, to the question of whether the Methuselah can be spoke to me in this part of the book, actually, I, I, on this trip, I'm a, you know, I've been touring for the book for a while now, both in America and in Europe. If you, the, the, the question like that is usually asked the other way, do I speak the truth? <laughs> now that I've, that I've had this religious conversion. Uh, and my answer is always, boy, I'm not sure they do much with anything I can tell them. <laughs> but yeah, that one spoke to me in a lot of ways. And continuously, you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I, I tap into that even when I'm at the podium and telling you the story. I'm remembering this guy and, and, and what, you know, what I was feeling and sensing and getting. The indigenous, indigenous American question, as I, as, I, as I said up here, this alienation, this descent into a full-fledged human exceptionalism, we did it all by ourselves, and there's no limit to what we can continue to do by ourselves, that's a pretty Western and pretty recent, uh, uh, pretty pathological state of, of mind. And that's why I, I, I made that comment about the, the, the the centrality of the non-human in so many indigenous uh, uh, cultures of the world, not just in North America, but th th throughout the world. I was facing a real challenge with this. As you all know, we're in a moment now where cultural appropriation is an extremely hot button issue. Uh, and I thought, it's going to, it's going to be very difficult to, for me to, to use uh, a contemporary Native American as one of my principles, without a, I mean, it, it really would challenge my my authority, my ability to to do uh, effectively. But it would also raise a lot of angles. It would raise a, a lot of potential misreadings. Um, 
Instead, what I ended up doing was having a lot of Native Americans at different points in the book contributing to this gradual awareness of the whole, you know, the, the, the westernized characters, you know, the sort of uh, those who were inside this culture of human exceptionalism. So that those voices are there, they're problematic, they're challenging, they they they, they slow down the protagonist since it's the protagonist that has to have the conversion. Since I was saying earlier how it is such a central driver to the way that these nine stories work, there has to be a metamorphosis, there has to be a conversion. And it, it made less sense. Although I guess you could tell an interesting story if you were capable of had access to the communities of a Native American, a very Native American, who was being colonized by you know, that same sense of human exceptionalism and had to recover his or her own long legacy. I mean, that would be that would be a very, you know, very potentially productive story. But instead, I did it from you know from from the uh, you know, the, the, the Western perspective uh, being uh, agitated into transformation. So, for instance, the very end of the book, um, the the artist at the school that Joseph was talking about is creating this gigantic and the Goldsworthy kind of land art. Oh, he's thinking in terms of centuries. He's moving around these dead logs on the floor of the northern forest. And he's, he's going to, to move them into this enormous pattern that's so large you can't even tell what it is when you're standing in front of it. But it spells out the word still. And his intention is that over the following decades and centuries, these will, will act as nurse logs. And the, and the next forest generation will grow up on that sense line. And from space, or you know, from, from high above, you'll see trees spelling out this word. It's an enormous project, and along the way, he's helped by a father and many of uh, four of his sons, um, and a pickup truck, and uh, a number of power tools, and, and chainsaws, and so forth. Uh, and they are. Uh, they are Native Americans. And they uh, start up an acquaintance and they start up a collaboration on this artwork. And at one point, you know, making a sort of typical white guy fashion and saying, it's amazing you know, how, how much you can hear here when you just stay still for a while. And, and this is you know, this, this, this family that's uh, uh, helping him out and sort of chuckles to themselves and says, you know, we've been trying to tell you that since 1492. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just mentioned manifest destiny. Uh, the, the concept of, of manifest destiny is that, you know, that's from the point of view of the European colonizers coming to um, coming to North America, seeing this vast land filled with uh, incredible uh, net for, uh, forests, forests yes. that will never be cut down in yeah. a thousand years. And, and you know, animals living there and, and oil on the ground, and they felt like the destiny was manifest. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about a book Simon Sharma has written called Landscape and uh, Memory, yeah. which is to me a wonderfully smart book about how nature and landscape forms a certain kind of national mindset. Right, and, and that's what it's trying to get to in your yeah. question number two. That it's, it's, the, it's the mere existence of this landscape. Now, I was curious about it. How do you think like, the, the, the American landscape has formed the American mindset? Well, well, it's not too big a question because it's, it's such a big question. It's a huge question, and, and this, uh, uh, what was that? It was Frederick Turner, I think. The, the, yeah, the, 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 the right, yeah. the, the yeah. Uh, the uh, frontier. The frontier, yes. Yeah. 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 And may, maybe too large to get into, but you kind of hinted at it. Yeah, know? so the frontier is, is the fact that there's a feeling in America that they just in the 19th century, there's always a frontier, always yeah. something that needs to be conquered. But yeah. is it sort of a value in conquering now? Isn't so that a way that they might see themselves in a bit? One of the most famous lines in American literature, uh, the, you know, the closing line of one of the most famous books in America. Time to lie out for the territories, right? From 
And, and this idea that when you mess up out east, there's always some place farther that you can get to. Uh, so that's that's definitely in and, and again it's it's Europeans leaving a continent where all the primary forces were already gone. And in fact there's a there is a, a, a lyric passage in the book, uh, a kind of um, poetic rhapsody about the eastern white pine and these vast forests of eastern white pine that the first Europeans saw when they arrived. You know, a, 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 a meter and a half thick, you know, for, for a tree. So now the, the biggest white pines that you can see are a fraction of that. No one alive has ever seen what a white pine can do. Um, the, 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 the point is that the British were in New England to get those trees because the high technology of the day was the frigate. There wasn't a tree left in Europe that was big enough to service a mass of one of these ships. They, you know, by the time of you know, the 1760s, they were branding these trees. They found any big ones on anyone's land. They were branding these trees with the king's arrow. In other words, it's no longer your property. It belongs king. Yeah, to the state. Didn't really go over well with the people whose land it was. <laughs> and this was a huge contribution to the American Revolutionary War. It's one that kind of gets lost in the way that we learned the, the, the history of the It's about Texas and the yeah. trees. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but once again, you know, it, it is this non-human thing that's causing the political dramas of, of the, the, this fitful passage toward you know, the, the transformation. I was reading by, by Shama, and he describes um, somewhere in the second half of the 19th century where the first um, rebels, huge, yeah. all the visible trees yeah. are discovered. Can you imagine? Okay. I mean, with it, it was like 1855, I think, when the first Europeans were somewhere out. And the guy, the, the, there's a record, there's a story about the first guy who's documented, the first European, to see these trees. And he knows that when he comes back to his camp, that, the, that his cohorts aren't going to believe him. So he invents this story about shooting a grizzly bear or something like that, and wounding this bear, and they have to come back and help him get the bear. And they come back and he says, actually, this is what I want you to see. <laughs> yeah. and, and, but at the same time, and, and this, is, this is, of course, one of the things we're still dealing with, to some extent. Um, on the one hand, the first thing they think of is, let's cut the tree down. This is amazing amount of wood. This, this tree that, that I just talked about, Within a year, it had been cut down and stripped and sent back to England and assembled just as bark to show how big it was. Yeah, the bark, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah. and uh, But at the same time, a few years later on, when, when the first botanists get word of these kind of trees, there's also this, this sentiment in, uh, I would say, you know, life and society that, you know, just as you said earlier, really, these trees were around since, since the time of Christ. Right. And they become almost bell bricks to these to these trees, and at the same time they were being cut down at a tremendous rate. And so it's always this the, those combined forces that on one hand you want to protect nature, and the other one is to exploit it. Yeah, you see that that's that's it in a nutshell. Our astonishment turns to anxiety and turns to a desire to master and control. And so th this might be the, the moment to make the faithful turn. I mean, we've gone quite a while without mentioning Donald Trump. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> just the very next guest. Next guest. No, we about Trump. One of his executive decisions was to pretty much uh, cut half of the national parks uh, in half. I I wake up every morning. As so many of us do, with a sense of absolute dread. What is it going to be now? But you know, when I was writing this book in, in, in 2016, in early 2017, I wanted to keep working on it. You know, I thought I had a year or two more just of pleasure and, and delight and refining and, and enhancing and expanding. And then I just thought, wait, you know, 
this this should get into the conversation as soon as I can get into the conversation. I mean, it, 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 it won't do much, but it will, it will be something. You know, it will be my form of activism. We're talking about an administration that in two years has rolled back 60 years of hard-fought, bipartisan environmental legislation. Um, not, not just the rescinding of the national parks, or in the national monuments, you know, the 85% of the barriers that we've all read about. But going against the Endangered Species Act, which has been like the primary legislative uh, leverage into environmental uh, suits, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and it's all defended on the basis of economics, which is utter nonsense. And so it's utter nonsense in, in, in a number of ways, and you can do the calculations. You don't, I mean, first of all, if, if, if you don't externalize costs, and if you do bring into the equation the uh, natural services that, that these landscapes provide, it's ridiculous to think that we can profit by eliminating that. But I mean, even, even more literally, um, I, the book moved me, changed my life in a lot of ways, but the research of the book brought me to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park because it's one of the last large remaining eastern broadleaf full growth remnants in the States. And I just fell in love and I stayed and I'm still there a few years later living there. Um, that park brings in a billion dollars a year to the local economy. You know, between 12 and 14 million people visiting every year because they're starved to see what the world looks like. No, no, why, why, if it's not the economical Right. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need more mines. You know, mines we, we need more. We should be building more of these power oh, you know, yeah. buildings. The real reason. Okay, what is the real reason behind the misogyny and, and the racism? You know that, that you can grab women by their genitals, or that you you can you know you can shoot at, at immigrants or, or or separate their you know mothers and children. It's all the same thing. It's a package of mastery and control. It's a package of people who had privilege and power saying, we are not going to give that up. And so the package looks so like this. Men should have power over women. Whites should have power over all other races. Americans should have power over the rest of the world. And human beings should have power over not many things. It's a single imperialist, paternalist package. Now, unfortunately, from my perspective, the ones that are getting all the attention, I mean, everything deserves attention. We need to know what is, you know, what the offenses are and what the proper counter measures are. But when these guys are gone, their war against LGBT, their war against immigrants, their war against women, can and will be reversed. But when there are mines in Bears Ears National Monument, that's done. That's done. No one no one it's an interesting point out now, too. No one on Earth has ever seen an old growth forest ecosystem come back from cut forest. There are interconnections and in species counts and dependabilities and, and the ecological reciprocal relations in an old growth forest that are not witnessed even in the longest standing second growth forest here in Europe or elsewhere. People will speculate. I mean, you know, some of them, scientists will sometimes say it will take between 500 years and 1,000 years for these ecosystems to mend themselves. But they're just guessing because they're not seeing it. Yeah. Is, is there anyone in the There's a question, two questions out there. But let's start up there. Uh, yeah.
although you approach it quite scientifically in your book, it's about interdependence and interconnectedness a lot, a lot, and it reminds me of Buddhist philosophy or even Christian ethnic uh, of I don't know. Um, and I was wondering, you shortly mentioned that it was a transformative experience for you to write as well. So I was wondering if you could reflect on how it's shaped you as a writer, like how it shapes us a bit as a reader, maybe as well. Especially, I remember finishing it on a plane and I was sobbing at the end. And I realized that I was sobbing because of not just the characters, but the trees as well. Wait, the tree in my arms, in a way. I found it really interesting and I'm sorry how you reflect on the transformation part of yourself. I'm still sitting together without stopping. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the symbols of uh, it. It changed the way that I spend my days. It changed where I am in the world. It changed what I see when I look out my window. And it changed some profound relationship that I had with justifying my own existence and, 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 and how I define myself and my work. Throughout most of my writing career, I was driven by tremendous work ethic. If I didn't have my 1,000 words a day, you know, oh my God, it's my backsliding, you know, it's, it's all going to come apart. And now I feel like if I don't have my, my eight kilometers in, in the park, I'm going to do my forest day and walking down that path, you know. That's, that's my work time. My work is to, is to, is to learn what's around me and to, uh, to as Thoreau says, to breathe the air, to drink the drink, to taste the fruits, to live any season as it passes, and to resign yourself to the fruits of the earth. Usually by eight kilometers, so many ideas that I want to write that I have to go home and start working. But so I, you know, it hasn't gone away. But there's a difference in the priority now. Presence and attention are the goal, not productivity. Um, there was a question of there, I think. There, the gentleman in the rugby sweater. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was interested in. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, this is in the comparison with the, with the American natives and on Australian, so obviously the Australian Aboriginals, who have a very spiritual connection with the land and don't have a concept of property. Yeah. And because they don't have a concept of property, they don't own the land, they look after them. That's right. Whereas if you have a concept of property, you own the tree, but if you don't own the tree, you look after it. It is so beautifully put, and better better than I could have seen it. And and what you put your finger on is this connection between human exceptionalism and capitalism and the ownership of things. And to many indigenous cultures, it's an absolutely absurd idea. How can you own another living thing? How can you own the land that other living things are growing on? There, this comes back into the book in so many ways. There is one extended story where uh, two people go up into, you know, 80 meters high into one of these redwoods that's being threatened by, by a Texas financier who uh, goes into debt to buy a family logging business and then starts to gut the, 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 the capital in order to pay off the debts that he acquired to buy the company. So it's capitalism and science, you know. Um, and they're up there, and the loggers are coming every day and saying, you idiots, you know, these things grow back. What are you doing? You're depriving us of our livelihood. We need to make a living. And this isn't your tree. This is somebody else's tree, you know. And there's a moment where they look down and, and, and the woman of this couple says, we're not saying don't cut because we need to live and, and cutting it will be a part of our life. 
They, she, she says, cut it as if it's a gift. Not as if it's your God-given legacy. Because nobody wants to squander a gift. Right? You simply have a different relationship to that. The, the character of Patricia at the end of the book, in, in this lecture that she throws at Stanford, about what's the best thing that we each can do to the future of your she revisits the question and she says, she raises the bar pretty high, she says, whatever you make from a tree, just make sure it's as good as the tree was. That's beautiful. You just mentioned how writing on this book changed your life. Um, would, would you maybe wonder, has it changed your outlook on fiction? And, or, or perhaps those, you know, even now the midterms are coming up. It's, you know, the center is clearly not holding. Yeah. Um, has it changed the way you look at your profession and the way you, you see a certain task for the right? It, it has, and, and I spoke a little bit about it in the introduction. And, and maybe I, 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 I actually feel slightly more sanguine than, than I, I think I might have come across in the introduction. Because I, I do think that we are all going to start thinking differently about literature and the stories that we need to tell ourselves now as, as we become increasingly aware of just how deep the catastrophe is. Yeah. Um, th those stories are, are you know, they, they never really left, but they're going to come up, up, up above ground again. The important thing is, I will, I will go to my grave defending fiction. As Patricia says when she's struggling to write her own book, you know, um, all the facts in the world won't change a person's mind. Only a good story will do that. And this is something that psychologists have actually experimentally demonstrated again and again and again. You can look at the graphs, you can, you can hear the numbers, but until there's a polar bear on that little sheet of, you know, that little piece of ice you know, floating out to sea, you're not going to be moved viscerally. And it's that visceral movement that gets people to rearrange the, the whole structure of thought that, that's designed to hold it's it. It's also the writer to put the ice there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I found an, uh, an interview with you by, I think at the time you showed the um, the stencil of the, your, your performance here in 1991, was 92? Right. I found an interview with you in St. Olaf's Oh, don't hold your response. Yeah, but I hope you're responsible. Yeah, I'm not saying From 1991, it was Heine, and he said, all writers secretly, or not so secret, secretly, want to change the world by writing. So, how has that changed for you? Uh, in the sense of how, how does it change what you want to change? I, that still sounds possibly true to me. Okay. Uh, but it maybe it sounds a little grandiose, but to, to, to move some person is to change the world. Right? If you if you actually, you know, I mean when when you said you're not looking at trees the same way, to, to me that's changing the world. Yeah. I think it was a question, two questions out there. I was the first <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Uh, great inspiration, inspiration you are. I've worked in the environmental movement, and um, one of the things we realized is that if it's not solution oriented, people are not going to be active, they feel paralyzed. So I'm actually quite distraught that I actually were both of you saying about dystopian. Don't we need more utopian? Yeah. Oh, good point. And, and you know, sometimes there's a seed of utopianism in the dystopian formulation. You know, like you have to go to the bottom to see what can emerge out of it. Yeah. So they, they might not be two completely inimical narrative strategies. Um, there's a, there's a fascination with watching things come apart, but again, as, a, as an antibody, and as a strengthening, so that now, you know, when, when all of the, the, the wrongness, the superfluity, and the, and the you know, mistakes have been stripped away, who are we, what do we want to do? 
And, and often, I think, in this Soviet novel, we'll, get, we'll, we'll pair the drama down to that hub and say, OK, here we are. Yeah. Let's, let's see what's next. Yeah. Was a question? Yeah. Um, you sounded in your instructions to talk about um, what your teachers told you about the, the schematics of uh, these different types of novels. Uh, I'm a teacher. So I was wondering, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that that is not uh, the, the most inspirational approach to break everything down to schematics. Um, and you use struggles very well, but as well for the person. Would you have any words of wisdom for me? What can I share with my students to yeah. change the world in that yeah. way? I um, I actually liked that schematic quite a bit. Obviously, I'm 61 and it's still with me, and I'm still you know going, extracting whatever I can for it. You know, in in other places. So I am involved with that. Um, yesterday, I met with the man who translated Three Farmers, my first novel, and. He's, he's, he's wrestling with severe health difficulties, but remains an incurable optimist and a teacher, right, despite great incapacitation. And he said he had a moment of inspiration a few years ago where he's, he, 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 in teaching literature, um, he has, instead of seeing the task as imparting what might be in the work, to students wrestling to get to it. He reverses the burden of responsibility and he, he asks them to say a couple of things. I mean, one is, what does this possibly have to do with you? You ask me the questions. And let's see where we can go from there. And then this other thing too, you know, when I talk about being colonized by this private synthetic meaning and commodity culture of individualism. We're so busy when we read, trying to decide whether we liked something or not. You know, whether it was five stars or four stars at least. You know, we can, it, as Boy has said, you know, liking and not liking, our sentimental acts may have nothing to do with really understanding literature. Right? So he says, and this is very wise, he says, who would you need to be for this to be an essential work? So now, instead of telling me whether you like it or not like it, move yourself and describe to me the collection of experiences and values that you would need to hold in order for this book to be a mess. And it's, it's a powerful exercise because it involves imaginative empathetic extension already, just to answer the question. Yeah, uh, Richard, unfortunately, the time we're all just getting to, so I was curious, one final question. Um, you're willing to sign your books, but you're, you have this own special way of doing it. Could you tell us about it? Sure. Yeah, so we, so, uh, I've lost contact with very kind to make some beautiful exhibits and exhibits that I'll, I'll describe and, and sign and you can paste them right into your book wherever you like. Um, and there are all people who say, but why not write into my book? That's what I really want. And I have to tell this story, which is, it has to do with three farmers. So you saw that, that zombie photograph, you know, taken just before the First World War. And the book is an exploration of meaning or value, let's say, in the age of mass reproduction. So it's a search for the original photograph, and of course there are no original photographs, they're all the same. And, and you know, this the famous essay by Walter Benjamin, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, what gives something value when there are a million other things exactly like it. That's a big challenge to us here in, in this world now. And we can solve it by, by, by a somewhat reactionary way of making of, of returning to the world of rarity and aura and collectability and saying, well, actually, we can, we'll make a few of them special, right? Different from all the others, and those will be the ones that are worth more. It doesn't make sense in books, right? What is the value of a book? The value of that copy is that you own it, and you underline the messages, and you put no 
went to the margin and turned the page down and broke the spine and spilled the coffee, right? It seemed hypocritical to turn around and say, oh, but I will make a, a, a limited author's edition and I will touch with you and they will gain extra value. Right? But I know that people want a connection with the author. I mean, think about this as a thought term. If you walked into Athenaeum and bought a signed copy, it wouldn't have quite the cachet for you than if you came to the John Adams Institute and talked for a little bit and see your own personal name. So what I used to say back in the day was, if you want a personal connection with me, write me a letter, and I'll write you back, and I'll sign the letter. <laughs> that was good enough in 1991, 1995. Now you can't you can't sell a book with a with a commercial publisher and not go out on tour and not do something and sign that. So our our compromise is I'll sign the sticker. You have to put the sticker in the book and then you have to read it and then you have to get that book. I'll now give the floor to to Tracy and first Richard. Thank you so much. Well, thank for you. Being here. Here. Well, thank you.
I do encourage you to buy the Dutch edition yes, because the publisher went to a lot of trouble and expense to make sure that there is a Dutch edition and to bring Richard here. So uh, I think everyone will be very curious to see those last passages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for coming up. Thank you. December 6th, discussing the fallout of the elections on Tuesday. And on December 11th, I think, <laughs> well, of course, I think it's all special what we do. So I'm not objective. But this one I really am looking forward to. Michael Pollan, whom we know as a food writer, has written a book on psychedelica. And as moderator, we have asked the uh, Belgian psychiatrist, Damien Denis, whom some of you may remember from the Sommer Hostel, to uh, have what promised to be a fascinating conversation with um, Michael Paul. If you want to help the John Adams, which I'm sure you do because you're here, become a member if you're not already, or a patron. You can also become a member of our friends or of our family. And what you can all do, and that doesn't cost anything, and I hope you will, is tell your friends about us and bring a friend. See you soon. Thank you very much.